My name is Aziz. This is Abu Bakr and that's Fozan, and we're here to present Lounge, an online platform that automates the room assignment process within the MIT dorms while preserving the, the diversity and differences among those dorms for assigning the rooms. MIT is one of the unique schools in this country where uh, the students run the housing process entirely themselves. For some reason, MIT trusts us. If you're asking why, I ask the same question. Um, where the students at Students will elect people at every dorm to assign to set up the lottery process every year. And um, the bad thing about this is that up till now it's done mainly manually, where with the aid of a you know a bunch of spreadsheets and data here and there. And what we wanted to do is just basically saying, hey, this process can be, you know, can be brought to the 21st century really easily by just creating an online platform that can handle assigning the rooms. And in, when, when we were exploring this you know, simple solution, we actually found four ma main challenges that m might be an obstacle in moving from the automated solution to the online solution. The first of which is that there's a lot of data cluttered everywhere. And w when, you're a, when you're a room assignment chair, you have to keep track of a lot of data here and there. Uh, and you have to sync it with MIT housing as well. The second big challenge was that dorms do their how room assignments vary differently within MIT. Some dorms get really, really, really creative where you know you can even hand your room to someone else, right? Um, the third challenge was that you know there are a lot of little perks about the rooming assignment that you have to deal with. Let's say you know you you there's the option that you know you squat, you squat your room, you're not part of a lottery. There's an option that you know I you choose a roommate and then you have, your system has to guarantee that you know those two people actually live together. Um, and also uh, things like you know you can choose designate someone to choose the room for you. All of these things actually happen in the real manual lottery because you know you can text someone and say hey pick my room for me and that will happen. So without having that flexibility, you know an online solution will not exist. The last of which is that the, you know when you're doing things manually, you can handle errors really really easily. Let's say someone missed their slot, all they need to go is go up to someone and say hey I was late, can I pick a room now? And then you know you have to decide on the spot whether you want to do that or not. Uh, also when you know when someone chooses a room that you know they didn't actually want and they changed their mind, you know how do you handle these things? So those are you know big four challenges that we found that we actually need to address in order for this solution to uh, to, to be available uh, for for the residents. So when we created Lounge, not only did we address those problems, but we added lots of features to make the uh, to make the housing process much simpler, much faster for the rooming chairs, as well as much more engaging for the residents who are actually going through it. So, for example, if you're if you're a rooming chair administra administrating this whole lottery process, the way it works is you simply go on our website, use the use the spreadsheet that MIT Housing gives you, and just import it using a simple button into our website. All of that data is immediately zapped into our system and everything is set for the lottery process to start. Once that's in the system, you can simply start the lottery process. You just need to enter in a couple of parameters that define how you want to carry out the lottery process. As Aziz mentioned, different dorms do it differently, so these parameters simply capture all of, the diff all of that different variation. Once that's ready, you just click Start and the lottery process starts for all of the residents that are in the dorm. Once the lottery process is finished, you click End, all of those results get saved as, a, as an Excel document, you download it, and you send it to MIT Housing. It's that simple for the rooming chairs. Similarly, for the residents who are going through the lottery process, the lottery process is a lot more interesting, a lot more engaging. So when you, come, when you log into the website, you see, an intera you see interactive floor plans of all of the different floors in your dorm. You can hover over the different rooms, you can see information about those rooms, you can see who lives in that room, you can see the size, uh, you can see who's interested in that room. So we, we also implemented features to show to to follow rooms and to receive status updates about you know when that room is available, when that room is taken. Uh, once you're ready to choose a room, when it's your turn in the lottery process, you can go ahead and simply click choose, and that chooses the room. If you miss your slot, uh, we have an open rolling window that allows you to choose a, choose a room later, no problem. Uh, you can unchoose room if you make a mistake. Our system also allows you to designate roommates to choose rooms with, and allows you to squat and unsquat, as uh, Aziz mentioned. Great. So, how did this all happen? During the development of Lounge, we have adopted the Lean methodology, in which will keep us a tight feedback loop during development. So, since day one in January, we sa uh, we sat with the housing chairs from Massey Hall and different dorms to figure out what challenges they, they wanted to address and what issues they, uh, or what features they, they desired to implement. 
Um, so upon like you know, uh, identifying and categorizing these different features, we try to implement them in our lounge and then come back to these uh, housing shares to see if they like the implementation that you know of the features they desired or not. Um, and after that, we also present it to the users because we do not forget uh, this app is targeted for both the housing shares and also the residents themselves. Uh, after we add, you know, after going through this cycle a couple of times, we have come up with a very solid b uh, platform that we think would support, you know, the housing assignment. And then we decided to do our first mock-up with Massey Hall uh, two days ago, and where we invited Massey residents to come and uh, try our um, actual um, ho electronic housing system. Uh, based on the testing. We, uh, it turns out that the people and uh, residents liked the way they interact with the website. The navigation and the user interface was smooth, and none of them essentially had a question on, like, on what to do or how to you know, choose rooms and so on. Um, they also provided the feedback um, that was very essential. So the, it turned out that the use, the, most of the users um, desired a feature to add preferences, or like, I would like to add this room to my wait list. In which I would not, I, I would need to, you know, stay, um, like, stay up onto my slot and choose the room. I'd like to set this up beforehand. In which, when my slot comes into place, I would like the system to choose it for myself. So we implement that feature within a day. So, you know, do the flexibility of the system, um, and also uh, based on the feedback for the users, you know, uh, uh, gave the Massey government finally decided or voted to adopt the system in our official housing um, lottery, which will be this Saturday. Scalability, which is really important if anything you do. Um, our, since day one, as Fozan mentioned in development, we had a very clear idea of how we want to approach dorms. Uh, the rooming chairs of every, uh, every one of those dorms were very involved in our design process where we made sure that whatever product we had is something that's going to accommodate their needs. We did multiple iterations of our prototype, give it back to them where, you know, asking the question, is this functional enough for you? Is this gonna serve your purpose? Um, so our, our idea is that, you know, right now we want to use Massey as a model where the other dorms know that the functionality exists, right? But they don't necessarily know that, all right, if I'm if I implement it, is it gonna fail, is it gonna work, right? So there's this, these questions that they're gonna ask. And our idea is that Massey is the biggest dorm on campus. And if, if the Massey lottery goes smoothly, then essentially that's gonna be a model for all, all the other dorms to adopt this solution. Also, because of that, when we were developing the product, the, we kept in mind how we we're going to integrate it with other, um, with other dorms, keeping in mind that some dorms also have what is called you know, house management systems, where you know, they have some online functionality for their dorm. So we do have the, you know, the option of exporting the entire package and just, and just running it on their own servers, and they, which, me, which essentially they can link it to, to, uh, from, from their whatever system they use, they can just use our engine of room, as, room assignments on their platforms. Um, uh, the, another point is that we also realized that there, with this data available in such a platform, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of room to, to go beyond just assigning rooms, which is this idea of plugins uh, came. And as you can see, there's a, you know Assassin's plugin where you can manage a game of Assassin's within a dorm. And that's very, very simple. It took actually you know, a couple of hours to actually put this entire plugin up. Um, and the, um, the, 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 the idea is that you know, with that kind of data, we, as a proof of concept, developed three different plugins that can be used to, to promote social interaction within a dorm. But also, in addition, we also provided a public API for developers to essentially develop whatever functionality they, they desire within their dorm and just add that functionality as a plugin to the system. Um, and that's all very, very modular. We're really excited to see the results of our lottery this Saturday. And moving from there, we will take that platform and deploy in other dorms at MIT. Thank you very much for your time, and we'll take your questions. Okay, so the question was, uh, when it's someone's turn to choose their room, how long do they have before their window expires? 
that's actually a big question, big design question that we faced when we started this uh, process. So we were thinking, you know, let's say we give someone 10 minutes to choose their room, and they miss, their, they miss that slot. What happens? In real life, you know, that's not a problem. They can just talk to the rooming chairs. So we came up with a clever solution to accommodate that using rolling windows. So basically what happens is you have start time. So our system stratifies people based on how many points they have according to whatever metric the rooming chairs use, but then doesn't assign stop times. So for example, the first one on the, uh, on the li lottery list can start choosing their rooms first. Second ones can start choosing their rooms 10 minutes later, but the first one's time never ends. So if they're a little bit late, it's no problem. You know, maybe someone has chosen a room before them, but then they can always choose a room. There's no end time that it takes care of that problem. Could I have a question back there? Got a question? Um, So yeah, so we've actually been talking to uh, several different floor chairs on Burton Connor to see how they do their system. And what we found is actually our system is, uh, you know, we've been talking to them and we've designed our system such that it's completely flexible. Uh, instead of having dorm-wide units, we simply have floor-wide units. Uh, and actually, let me repeat the question. <laughs> uh, the question was, can, 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 uh, this, can our system accommodate dorms who do their process differently such that the whole dorm doesn't participate in the lottery at once? Rather, each floor uh, has their own mini lottery. And yes, uh, we s instead of ha we have floor plans for individual floors, all of the all of the dorm wide basically becomes basically floor wide interactions. Yeah. Does your system also can you use not a lottery with your system? Like, can you make a configuration and then everyone has to like approve the configuration before moving on or something like this? Because I know I know some floors do like a uh, what are called like a consensus based rooming or whatever that does use a lottery. So is this only with a lottery? Yeah, so the question was, are there other modes of operations besides lo lotteries for our system? And yes, so not every dorm does a lottery-based system. Some people put, put, some dorms put people into groups, and those groups choose together. And our, our system accommodates all of that. People can choose rooms together as well. Yes? How are you tracking the information about the dorm will be updated, floor plans, et cetera, et cetera, so once the things change, yeah. reconstruction happens? Yeah, so I mean, um, like as you saw, like in Massey, I mean, Massey, uh, all the information about uh, rooms or like a floor plans are published online. So for Massey, for instance, we went to like housing at MIT and fetched all these data and populated it. Let me, let me just add to that answer just a little bit. Uh, so again, the question was, how do we imagine that the information will be updated uh, for uh, different dorms? And so we've actually, we mentioned two modes of operation for our, uh, for our system, which is from the, RA, from the rooming chair's point of view, as well as from the resident's point of view. There's also a super admin uh, mode of operation where people can add entire buildings if they, would, if they like. Uh, it's a very simple, nice, again, uh, nice user interface where people can add floors, people can uh, update floor numbers, people can update floor information, people can update building information. All of that also exists for uh, updating information. Any other questions? That's a good question. So um, how long do we expect the uh, Massey lottery to take if they use our system instead of the current system? So the current system takes several days. Uh, now, we've made it as flexible as possible for the rooming chairs to be able to set how long each, each person gets. Um, so we were thinking, any, you know, realistically speaking, it could take several hours. Uh, but after talking to the RACs, they actually want more time. Uh, to be able to go in and you know fix things in case anything goes wrong, so we're expecting probably several hours over two days, so altogether maybe eight to ten hours. Thank you very much. I'm Oliver Thomas. I am with ISNT. I've been involved with iCampus. Uh, on the judging side for, I don't know, three years or something like that. It's been incredibly entertaining and rewarding to see all the great projects go by and to see where they end up in the future, right, Danny? Um, and uh, Jeff and I both, uh, Jeff's up next, so sorry, I'm um, stealing his thunder, but we both work in a group called the Faculty and Student Experience in ISNT where we uh, try to engage with faculty and student projects uh, related to um, IT and computing as much as we can. Thank you, Oliver. I'm Jeff Schiller, and uh, as Oliver says, I work in the faculty and student experience group, and I actually spend most of my days working with Hal Abelson on App Inventor, 
and I alternate that with working with the Security and Emergency Management Office on MIT Alert and notifying the community, which we've been doing way too much recently. Uh, but that's a whole other story. And this is my first year judging an iCampus projects. Hi, I'm Danny Ben David. Um, I'm just some kid. And uh, <laughs> I also, by some stroke of luck, won this competition last year and um, have been a judge for all of 20 minutes. Um, it's really exciting being on the other side of this. Uh, my project, Course Road, did uh, four year course planning, academic planning for undergraduates, and has since grown to be a little too well known across the MIT campus, which is still surreal for me. So it's really exciting getting to see all the projects around the next year around. Uh, so hi, I'm Michelle, and this is Sean, and the project that we worked on is called Terminus. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a second. So bo both of us are MIT students that are very interested in games and MIT. So the basic premise is you, uh, the, here's some buzzwords I, I put on the screen. You Feel free to ignore them. You can, we can just listen to me talk. So the point is that we made a Linux learning game. That's essentially it. When you come to MIT, you're confronted with Debathina. You open, up your you open up the computer and you see this black box. And you go, oh my god, I'm just a freshman. I've never seen a terminal in my entire life. What do I do with this? Well, that's where we come in. We made this, uh, if you go to our, our website, terminusgame.mit.edu, a shameless plug here, you uh, end up with a pretty little website that basically mimics the terminal. We decided to take the principles of a text-based adventure game, working in a safe environment to explore the terminal world and make it into a game. There's a couple of really nice reasons why you'd want to do this, because a regular terminal doesn't give you any kind of feedback. It's not very safe in case you remove all of your problem sets and uh, all of your data. You don't want to do that. So we made a safe environment for you to explore a world that does this and teaches you how to do this uh, while having nice little graphics on the side. Um, so the, uh, the other nice thing about it is that because we made this game, we can also provide some instruction for how to learn particular terminal commands. For example, when I was learning uh, how to use Linux, I didn't know where to look for which commands I needed to learn. I didn't know what resource to look at for which MIT specific commands were, would be useful or how to get that information. And our game gives that to you in a very directed way. So here's some examples for uh, yeah, everyone knows, or maybe they don't know. I didn't learn until a long time into my MIT career that the phrase tell me combo is an Athena command that tells you the combination of the, all the Athena clusters. Very useful to know. In our game, this does the same thing. It tells you how to get into the Athena cluster. You can't go into the room that is the Athena cluster without the combination. And to find out that this command exists, you have to basically interact with other objects in the world. A helpful TA happens to hint to you that this tell me combo exists. And with that, you, um, you learn about these commands. Things like MV, CP, less, a bunch of other commands, they're set up as obstacles or scenarios that you have to kind of work through in the game to get past to un unlock new levels. Uh, for example, there's one particular case where you have to remove an ugly troll to reveal a tunnel in the background, and after you do that, you get to learn a new command that tells you this other thing. But the, but the cool thing is that we don't tell you that these are commands that you use to interact with the world. They're spells. Linux is magical. We all know that. So there's a little fudge factor there. If something doesn't work, if, you don't, if you're not really sure why it works, uh, it's a spell. That's, that's how it is. The, that brings me to the man pages of this whole thing. If you've ever used Linux before, you know that man pages are really cryptic. They're kind of hard to read, kind of hard to find. Ours are a little bit less cryptic, but still a little bit cryptic, just to get you really familiar with how Linux actually works. Uh, except they're, they're introduced to you in the form of asking an old man for help. So as, as you can see, we tried to kind of correlate uh, spells with commands and you know, give a little bit of context to why they're called certain things, like ls. I don't know why it's called ls in Linux, uh, but we, we call it look at your surroundings, which kind of makes sense. Uh, the, another cool uh, feature that, you can, that we have is that if you play through a little bit of the game, you want to come back later. The game's pretty long to get to the end to find paradise. Haha, -ha, HTFP. Um, the, if, you want, if you don't want to play all the way through, you can close the browser, open it back up. It remembers what you did. It remembers where you are. So you don't have to work through all of these silly commands that, you know, I've done CD a million times. Why can't I just learn some more stuff? Well, you can. Um, some cool technical features about the project. Uh, it's all hosted in static JavaScript, which means no server maintenance necessary. As many people can ping the website as possible, and it will still work, which is super nice. 
uh, because there's really no reason to store any data. All, you're, all you are doing is learning at your own pace. Uh, you retain that information much better, but we don't have to store anything for you. Uh, we also have to remember that our target audience is not hardcore Linux users. Our audience is exactly stu new students or community members who are new to the MIT Debathena computing environment. So we don't, while we tested on uh, hardcore Linux users and people who have never used Linux before, you know, we prioritized getting the features out that would teach people how to use Linux as opposed to things like tab completion, like the up arrow gives you the previous command, all of which work, by the way, in case you're wondering. But it doesn't, it's not the goal to teach people to like perfect their hardcore Linux skills. It's is exactly to get people oriented with navigating a command line and simple commands. Uh, all the code is open source. Uh, it's all, you know, it's all static. It can be exported anywhere. And if you want to add, or if we want to add new levels, we can do that. Our framework and our back end is really simple. So there's talk of expansions to things like awk, grep, uh, more uh, MIT specific commands that Debathena has that are very useful. So again, all these buzzwords. We're gamifying how, uh, we're, we're gamifying the teaching of Linux commands. And that was our goal, and I think we did it well. Thanks, I'll take any questions. So if it's all static JavaScript, then the, save, the state that you're in is saved in a cookie or something? Mm -hmm. The question was, how is all the data stored if it's static JavaScript? Is it saved in a cookie? Yes, you figured us out. <laughs> The fastest playthrough I heard someone try was about like 20 minutes. Um, that's fast I heard of from my playtesters, so. As a follow-up follow -up question, <clears throat> if, let's say I want to go back and learn something right now, can I, is there a way to jump back to prior chapters or whatever of the info? Uh, so in, in a regular terminal, you can't just like, in, you can't say like CD desktop, you have to like CD tilde desktop, you can, you can do that. So you can go back home. Uh, the, a couple of the, there's like, they're kind of grouped into chunks. So the, y there's like, a, each of these chunks are linked to from home. So you can always go home and then start a new chunk. Yeah. Have you guys thought about doing any kind of assessment and kind of seeing what the users are after they've gone through the game and how much they've been getting and The question was about assessment. Uh, can I take so one of the things that we, we just did on our own was we took people that were kind of novices and had them play our game, and then we took them to a terminal and tried to have them like do, do some things that were like related. So for instance, we talked about how in our game, if you want to like look at, look at an item or something like that, we say, well, you have to like less that item, right? And then we say, all right, we want you to like look into this file and, and like tell us what's in it. And while, and initially they'll, they'll be like, I mean like, I don't know how to do that. I just came over, I'm like, well, Think about what you know. Think about what you've done, and they try it out, and it works. So we've done that, but nothing, nothing like you know, dynamically with, with the internets. Okay. Nothing formal. There's no test. Uh, how many people have you tested this on? The uh, question was how many testers. I don't know. I tested on maybe like 50 people over the course of the last couple of months. Yeah. Probably about the same. About yeah. Yeah, so when are you going to deploy this uh, project on the website and then uh, people will plug in or do you have plans to also integrate into the uh, you know, MIT system? The uh, question was about MIT integration. So it's currently, it, it is currently live on a website, so people can go to this website. Uh, the, when you talk about deploying to the general MIT community, you have to think about who your target audience is and when they want to use it. So if our target audience is incoming freshmen or you know, new employees or something, you know, it, it, the first time you open Firefox on a Debathena, potentially this could show up uh, as, as an option. Uh, during their, the freshman orientation event about uh, here's what ISNT is, here's Debathena, they could mention this. It, we don't have any plans to like m spam everybody about this, but it's, it's just going to be here. How old is your website? Uh, we might have plans to spam everybody. Else. <laughs> 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 or Jeff answer that question. No, we, we, do, we do run uh, Athena mini courses for the incoming class in the, uh, in the fall, so 
So this would be an interesting uh, thing to publicize alongside that, or uh, maybe instead of in some cases. One, one question I have for you guys is, one of the limitations of the static JavaScript approach is that you don't actually have a server on the back end that the uh, application communicates with, which does make some things harder, like centralized analytics, for example, or centrally tracking progress for individuals. Um, have you thought about uh, what might make sense to connect it up to and then embed um, calls in the application if we wanted to do some, not central tracking, but uh, for example, central rewards. And, you know, we talked that there might be some rewards for folks who complete the game. Um, but in order to do that, we would need to worry about things like basic authentication for users and centrally tracking that so that somebody just doesn't uh, script the client and you know, generate or pull the reward out of the source code, that kind of stuff. So. Uh, question, the, the, so the question was basically about uh, if there's going to be any kind of re reward system, you can't do it in st static JavaScript, what, what happens next? Um, right now, as it stands, we have no need for a central server. Uh, if it turns out that whatever happens, whatever features are required that might require a central server, we do one, but frankly, it's a lot easier to just keep it as static JavaScript because the, I mean, in terms of authentication, like if it's, if it's going to be integrated with MIT, you can use certificates, you can, you, you know, Sure, you can spoof a cookie, but like, I, I'm pretty sure that my cookie scheme is cryptic enough that no one is going to bother sifting through all the code to figure out what these like various numbers and hash codes mean in the cookie. Uh, if they really want to, sure, they can do it, but all, all the code's on GitHub anyway. So if they, if they wanted to, they, they could do it. Um, so my answer is I'm hesitant to use a server because it's very heavy and it's not really necessary. But if it becomes necessary, then of course we'll look at other options. Two people can't use a terminal at the same time either. <laughs> sure. Uh, the question was about multiplayer aspects. Uh, again, I'm going back to our, our goal and our target audience. Our goal was to teach novices how to use the command line. There is, I mean, I can't think of a scenario off the top of my head where I have two people on two command lines that are like talking to each other. So the, uh, uh, so I would hesitate to say I want to make this multiplayer. Like we want to keep this specific for our audience. There's no reason to add a feature just because it would be more fun. Well, it's it's kind of fun. You should try playing it. <laughs> And while the next group is getting set up, we'll continue with our judge introductions. I'm uh, Jeff Merriman uh, from OEIT in the Office of Digital Learning. And uh, I guess I have a couple roles here. I'm a judge, and I'm also the official photographer. So if anybody has issues, don't want, don't want your image to show up on an OEIT website or something, talk to me. I'm Jim Kane. Uh, I work in the uh, in OEIT also, and I manage the experimental learning environments here at MIT. And uh, because of that, uh, I'm very much interested in the uh, impact that your projects have on student learning and student life. Uh, Vijay Kumar, I'm uh, I direct the Office of Educational Innovation Technology, and. Uh, uh, with Paul there, have been associated with our campus from its uh, beginning. Hi, well, we're TouchBase, and we're here to introduce a new standard of business cards. So what is it? It looks and feels like any traditional business card, and it has the same disposability as any card. But inside of these cards, there's an additional layer of conductive ink. This ink is in a certain shape that your smartphone can detect. And what happens is it encodes a special ID that we can use to look up in our data table. So what you do is you take your card, you tap it to your phone, and the phone itself will load the information from our servers and download this information onto your smartphone. 
And once you have this information, you can either add it to your contact or you can simply view it and view links that are also available within this information. So we took the time to take into consideration, is our idea possible? So the first thing that we consider is how many unique IDs can we actually generate? So we use some very safe uh, calculations and some very conservative estimations regards to the error that may happen from a user missing the, the actual touch screen with their card or touching it at a very slant angle and see how many unique IDs we can generate. And we calculate to about maybe 15 billion unique IDs, which is more than enough for the entire world. We also contacted conductive ink makers and printing vendors, such as Kendall Press, in regards to the feasibility of actually printing out these cards. And they told us that the cost of these cards are extremely cheap because the ink is only an additional one cent for each card. And printing the cards itself will actually only require changing a nozzle at the printing vendor, such as uh, to make sure that we don't mix ink from uh, the conductive type and the regular ones that we print the, the cards with. So that's a little bit about our product. So how can we change MIT with this business card? So the first thing that we see is CPW. It's a huge event where all the new students, the newly admitted students, come to MIT to interact with their future classmates, as well as people who are already here. During their time here, they make their decision as to whether they want to come to MIT or not. And how they do this is based off of their connections. So at, MIT, at CPW, each newly admit goes around and kind of meets all these different people. And because they meet so many people, they start losing some of the connections that they've actually made already. And this is mostly due to the fact that either they get too many contact information or they start forgetting names of people who, they, who they've already met. And when they try to go home and look these people up on Facebook, they forget their name and you can't find them and you lose these connections. Because of these lost connections, you may, these newly admitted students might not decide to come to MIT. And so what we can do is we provide all newly admitted students who come to CPW with a packet of our business cards. What they do is they go around and exchange with other students. Through this exchange, they gain not only their contact information, but also their links to the Facebook accounts and Twitter and any other social media accounts that they want to upload onto their, their, their profile. And as a result of this, students have a bigger pool of connections to decide whether they want to matriculate or not. And ultimately, MIT's yield rate will increase. Another aspect of MIT life is career fairs. Students want to get a really stellar job for their summer internship, as well, and uh, it, recruiters want to hire really stellar students uh, for the job available. And the big pain point of career fairs, however, is a bunch of students go to the career fair, hand off their business cards, or actually, sorry, they hand off their resumes, and the recruiters give them brochures, business cards, and a bunch of other things that they have to collect. Once they go home, it's extremely tedious to go through and try to find, oh, how do I apply to this internship? How do I apply to this one? And the process is extremely difficult. If we introduce our product to the MIT career fair, then what we can do is unify every detail every information regarding the student and the recruiter in one piece of a physical uh, item, which is our business cards. The students can enter their resumes, their contact information, as well as their social media accounts, such as LinkedIn, and hand these off to the recruiters. What the recruiters can do is have the process for, for, uh, the, for applying to their company on the, their business card, as well as their name and contact information. During the exchange, all of this information is exchanged at one time, and you don't have to give multiple brochures. And when the students take their cards home, they, all they have to do is tap and download the necessary information. Ultimately, students are getting better jobs because they, they know who to, how to apply to more companies, and recruiters are getting better students because they get to view the resumes much easier. And as ultimately, MIT will have better ranking because their students are making higher salaries and recruiters are more happy with the people that they hire. Lastly is student IDs. All students at MIT have their own IDs. And th these already include NFC technology as well as a ma magnetic strip uh, on the back. 
The problem with these is that they require a special reader to process this information. And so a lot of times, students will use their, uh, student, will use their student ID to access TechCash. One of the biggest examples is going down the infinite. You get attacked by a bunch of peop people who are asking you for donations to their charity. And they ask you, oh, can you donate? And, they, and you may say, oh, I only have tech cash. And a lot of people can't process tech cash, or they do. And the only way to enter tech cash is a list of paper where you write down your ID. Sometimes it's illegible, and they can't process your payments. And it's a really difficult situation. But with our technology, all these students group will need is a smartphone. By downloading our app, they can tap the student's ID and immediately download the tech cash information that they need onto the phone th into the MIT uh, process. As a result, students get a easier tech cash exchange possibilities. So we're not only targeting just MIT, we're kind of going for a world effect. And one of the biggest things is, of course, business cards. We're inventing, we're basically reinventing business cards such that they're capable, to inter capable of integrating with our mobile dominated world. Business cards are still a very important part of business etiquette. So we can't remove business cards completely. Now, what people can do is when they exchange business cards, instead of going through and typing all the information onto your phone manually, they can just take the stack of business cards and tap them individually onto the phone and download all the contact information that they need. Not only that, we also provide networking information. So what happens is when the person taps the card, the giver of that business card can view whether or not that individual has tapped it. This gives the giver of cards a source of network information regarding who has tapped their card, when and where their cards have been tapped. Ultimately, they, know, they can know how well they're getting their name out to potential buyer and seller of products. We also target other possible uses of our technology. For example, inventory tags at big warehouses. We can basically have our technology imprinted into the products, such as the labeling, and be able to know the location of where each product is. We can also target personal identification, such as, uh, such as driver's license. And ultimately, electronic payments is another possibility. So at Touchbase, we're really hoping to make our business card, our technology, a new standard of business card for the future. Take any questions. So you would say you would embed this in an MIT ID, and then you can use it for purchases. Yes. Uh, so the question was, we can embed these this technology into MIT IDs and use them for purchases. Okay. The second part of the question is, okay. if I get you to tap your MIT ID on my phone, I can make a copy and then make purchases on your account. That is actually not technically. Um, I'd say we would actually be able to install like ways to prevent um, that possibility. But um, Technically, yes, you can install, but we will have ways of solving that issue. Uh, additionally, um, you could do that, but you would only get the location of the dots. In order for you to replicate that, you'd have to get another MIT ID, copy it onto there, and then somehow use that to buy something. Yeah. But in the same way, you can get a magnetic card reader that will read an MIT ID and be able to replicate it that way. My point is you have to decide what the use pattern is. Uh, if it's something that you freely exchange with people, like contact information, then that, that's one use model, and that's a completely valid use model. If you want to use it where it's a secret value that's used to make purchases, that's another use model, but you can't mix them. We agree with that. Yeah, it would also be easy to implement a process where uh, if somebody tests my card, I have to approve the transaction. It's not necessarily that I have your card and I can take your money. It would be uh, someone tap my card, and now I can authorize. Do you guys think it's the best I had one. <laughs> <laughs> 
my, so as an upperclassman at the time, I didn't have a mingle stick, and I saw every single pre-frosh going around saying mingle stick, and I just thought it was really silly, and they didn't seem to really get much out of it, because when they got back to MIT, like, everyone had lost it, no one really, like, everyone lost all the information on it. How is what you're proposing different than these mingle sticks? So the problem with mingle sticks is that it's not compatible with our current uh, way of communicating contact information. So nowadays, everybody has smartphones. Everybody has phones that can record this information. And mingle sticks, what happens is you go out through the day and you go like, oh, hey, you want to mingle? And then you, you, you transfer the information onto a USB stick. At the end of the day, you go home onto your computer and download all of the information. But with the, with the kind of technology we're providing, you can basically do it on the spot or you can do it back home. But it downloads it onto your uh, phone. The contact information on your computer is different than the contact information onto your phone. Your phone can immediately use the information to call someone, and it's extremely rapid. And you, a lot of integration um, aims towards the mobile integration rather than now integrating with personal computers because there's an extra step of transferring information from your computer back onto your, your, your phone. Yeah, and I would say that uh, it seems like the Mingle 6 is kind of like the app called Bump, uh, which is something that I think we... Uh, initially we're really excited about but then we realized that it was it was somewhat awkward to try to network using that because oftentimes either the networks down so you're often standing next to each other for maybe like you know 30 seconds trying to bump your phones and it seems like mingle six you, you kind of have to stand next to each other to beam an infrared ray right towards in, uh, into that device whereas we think with our product it's not necessary you could actually take this home um, it doesn't really distract from that networking process of you know, having to stay next to each other. There's no awkward interactions. You could really just take this home and then download the information. Yeah, that was awesome. Uh, so, okay, in that case, uh, people try this with QR codes also. Like, I remember there was a fad where everyone's business card had a little QR code and you would take a picture with your phone and it would do the exact same thing, but I don't see those around anymore either. So, yeah, again, it's about something to think about, that QR codes tried to do this and, and I, I don't know. Do you want to answer that? Yeah. Uh, so the question was, uh, so this was previously done with QR code business cards, but we don't see that around. Uh, what's different about our product? Uh, so we really kept in mind really the, the users uh, when we designed this product. Uh, if we think about the business world, a big reason why QR code business cards really haven't taken off is it takes up a lot of screen real estate or uh, real estate on the card. So if you're, think, if you're thinking about a company like BCG or uh, McKinsey, they don't want a big QR code like distracting from their branding. Um, another problem is I think just use, having to use a camera app is slow and clunky. And imagine if you come back from a conference, imagine if you come back from CPW, having to focus and take a picture for 50 different cards, it just gets tedious. Uh, so our thought is uh, we really kept the user in mind, um, thinking about if we were to roll this out beyond MIT, um, what would be necessary for this to be, become mainstream? I think uh, there's companies, think about it as well, but with you know, credit cards and stuff, a lot of times the ink wears off. So if I'm putting this on like a student ID or a driver's license, how long is it going to actually last? What happens when something starts going wrong? So to answer that question, the question is how durable is the ink that's inside these cards? First of all, the, car, the ink itself is embedded within the card, so it's not actually visual. Nobody can see where the ink is. Second of all, I can attest to how long this thing can last. I have made a business card prototype, the very first one, and currently it's in my wallet, and I've kept it in my wallet up until now, maybe for three or four months, and it still works, and there's no effect to the, to the, uh, to the degrading of the ink itself on the card. Right, so it's, it's sort of like... Yes. So, like the... Well, there was a, a little small demonstration on the, on the screen. So you take the card and you hold it and you tap it onto the phone and the interaction. It basically, the conductive ink acts like fingers for your smartphone and your smartphone can detect the location of these touches and using this, it encodes the information. Yeah, and I, I would say in addition to that, it's, um, you know, we, we don't want you guys to mistake that the conductive ink is going to be used to print the text in front of the, the card. It's going to be, you know, the text in front of the card is going to be using regular ink. This conductive ink is embedded, uh, I guess you could say, between the two paper layers. 
Um, and we've realized that that still registers on the screen when you tap onto it. So if you, I don't know, I'm just thinking about like security and what if I start like generating random docs? Do I just get people's contact information? So the question is regarding the security of being able to generate random dots and try to try to imitate another person's ID. So what we will do is, because we have 15 billion unique IDs, there's not going to be that many users. We can have redundancies, avoiding possible uh, replication of the same IDs. It's almost to the point of trying to replicate someone's password. It's kind of it'll take a lot of time to try to go through. The issue of if I just press randomly on the app, what are my odds of eventually hitting somebody and I get some random person's contact information? I mean, what's really the problem with you getting someone's contact information? Like the same way if someone drops a business card on the ground. I mean, if if you if you want the business card and assuming you're giving them out to a bunch of people anyway, you don't really have privacy of information then. So, I, you're giving them out to people you met, people you. But you're giving them the information, allowing them to do whatever they want with it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think a lot of those questions go back to the scope, though. Like yeah. Jeff was talking about how you're using it, whether it's for yeah. purchases and for for this personal information, yeah. public or private. Okay, thank you guys very much. Hello, um, my name is Louis. Uh, I'm a research engineer at Microsoft Research, in the same lab as Paul, and uh, my work uh, focuses mainly on the computer vision. So things like um, image recognition, object detection. Uh, and uh, so this is my first year being a judge in iCampus. I was invited here by Paul. So I'm looking forward to working with everyone. Uh, hi, my name's Paul Loka. I'm a research program manager in MSR. Uh, I was working with Hal Abelson uh, with iCampus back in the early uh, 2000s. Um, I actually was one of the co-directors of, of the program and been supporting it ever since and really enjoyed the, the student projects. Hi everyone, I'm Akanksha. I'm a junior in EECS. And my project is called Which Class? It's basically a tool to make choosing classes less painful for students. Because right now it kind of feels like Russian roulette. Um, so what Which Class lets you do is find classes across all the departments at MIT that cater to your interests. And um, it lets you do this in a fun and easy way. Um, and I think this is one place where the current advising system is failing because uh, MIT has 2,000 classes scheduled for next fall. Your advisor, even if their interests are fairly similar to yours, which they often are not, are, is not going to be able to keep track of all these classes. Um, and there isn't really anyone trying to um, help students uh, pick classes that match their learning goals. So if I really care, I really, really care about a good textbook, there's nobody who's going to tell me that this class is a good textbook. Or like there's this range of classes and maybe you should pick this one. Um, so the first big problem is um, choosing classes across departments because especially with a lot of the new interdisciplinary things like control theory, um, a lot of different people are teaching similar content, but they're using different language to talk about it. And this is a problem when you go to the course catalog and you try to search. So for those of you who saw my poster of the poor, confused student, um, when you search for machine learning in the course catalog, it shows you classes from six different departments. And it shows you classes that are not by any stretch of imagination machine learning classes. And it omits to show you some of our most popular machine learning classes. So um, the course catalog isn't super useful when you're trying to find classes. And I think which class, by letting you visualize connections between classes, um, lets you identify a cluster of classes that all have something to do with the thing you're interested in. 
Um, the second big problem is finding classes that match what you care about. Because what you care about is not the same thing that your friends care about. And there's this herd mentality that I've noticed among students here. And I'm guilty of it myself. I'll go ask my friends, what are you taking? Or my friends will tell me, this is a great class. This is my favorite class. And I've taken classes like that and hated them. And I realized that it's because, well, the things I care about are not the things that they care about. And MIT has done such a great job. Every semester, Professor White emails course six students saying, please, please, please fill out subject evaluations. And people take the time to fill it out. They're so detailed. But this information just sits there in its ivory tower, and nobody ever uses it. Um, and so I think that answering helping students answer questions like, what class can I take that has something to do with, I don't know, ship design, um, but that also has a lot of lab hours, for example as opposed to a lot of lecture hours? Or what class can I take where the recitations are really good? I don't really care about lectures, but I, recitations are really important to me, that kind of thing. And so what which class does is it takes the information that's already there in the subject evaluations and um, makes it accessible to students so that people can use them to filter really easily classes by the criteria that they care about. Um, and so, this is a picture of the interface. Um, the bottom portion is a dynamic graph that lets you quickly and easily visualize connections. Um, the thickness of the links um, is proportional to the similarity between the classes. Huh. And on the top is the quick evaluation um, filter. So you can filter out classes based on what students said about them. And um, one thing I want to point out, this is my favorite example because 6437 is a class called Inference and Information that I took last year and I really enjoyed. And I was just playing around with this and I've taken a lot of machine learning classes since then. What I did not know is that mechanical engineering has a class called Inference Learning and Estimation, 2160. I had no idea. My advisor is a machine learning person. He had no idea. And I looked at the content for this class because I found the link here, and it's it just it looks so similar to six four three seven and still has enough differences that I pre read for that class today. Um, so this has already demonstrated real value to me, um, and I, I so I tested it. This is up on the internet. It's out in the wild. I've been getting people to try it out, um, people in my living group, and they've given me a lot of good feedback. They've really enjoyed using it, and I think. One thing I want to point out is that this isn't trying to subvert the advising system. I think advisors still have a lot of value that they can provide. But I think that having a tool like this, so an advisor and a student sitting down in front of this screen, will just make that relationship much more productive. And um, lately, a lot of other interesting possibilities have come up. I know there was some talk about using this to investigate overlap in the curriculum by um, the administrators. Um, another thing that would be really interesting in the longer term is when students change those evaluation sliders, tracking that information and then giving that back to the administrators and the instructors saying, this is what students seem to care about. So closing that feedback loop, I think, is not happening in any way, shape, or form today. Um, so yeah, remember there's 2,000 classes being offered next fall and some of that, and not all of them are going to cover the things you want. Not all of them are going to do it in the way you want. But there will be classes that will cover the content you want in the way you want. And pre-read starts today. So for the students in the class, in the room, um, you should use this tonight. Um, yeah, I think this is a big problem. I think it's a real problem, and I think I have a real solution. Thanks. Questions? So I think Core 6 is the only one that has their own evaluations. Um, well, I don't know. Uh, it's the only one that I know about. Um, and I'm, Meki has her own? Oh, OK. So as of now, I'd like to, because this is meant to encourage students to look across course boundaries as well, I'd like to have a common framework 
a, a common um, interface at the top for sorting through. Um, and so I don't really want to make a subject specific interface because six web has its own criteria and McKean probably has its own criteria, but MIT subject evaluations has um, uniform. And I think as of last semester or last year, um, Corsic started using the, yeah. So there is data about these course six classes. There is data about the Mickey classes here. And I think the advantages of a uniform interface. Um, what They're more qualitative. Th that's definitely true. So one option could be to like for special things like that, have a panel on the side that pops up. Yeah. What is the actual, you know, how are you actually establishing that? So that's a good question. Um, that's what the majority of the work went into, actually. Um, so what I do is I'm scraping from the course evaluation website, um, also from the subject catalogs, and then looking at the descriptions of the classes um, and trying to figure out what things there matter. Um, so one really naive way of doing it would be to just say, well, if these descriptions have words in common, then probably they're similar, right? But the problem with that is words like uh and the uh, are not informative at all. Um, taking it a step further, there may be words that are informative like in English, like class is not actually a generic word like uh and the, uh, but in this context, it's a word that has practically no meaning in terms of similarity, right? Um, so Taking these ideas, um, what I did was I experimented with different natural language processing algorithms. Um, and the one I settled on is called TFIDF, Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency. And it's a pretty standard way of looking at a collection of related documents and finding out which words in this context are important. So something like Bayesian is much, much more important than something like course or PSAT or exam. Um, and then finding, so assigning every word an importance or relevance metric measurement, and then based on that, finding the cosine similarity between two descriptions. And then one, one more thing, um, because this is a force directed layout, um, what will happen is, especially when you have less things up on there, when you filter your classes down a little bit, um, because the attraction of two nodes to each other is proportional to the strength of their link, the thickness of their link, um, the machine learning classes, for example, will tend to congregate in a particular spatial region. So even if two classes are not connected to each other or they're not strongly directly connected to each other, if they have a common neighbor that they're both strongly connected to, they'll end up in the same space in the screen. Very similar topics are mm -hmm. explained in different manners. Mm -hmm. But here, language seems to be the main metric where actually you cross fire things together. Mm -hmm. So, how do you look at, you know, how do, how do these two things work together? So I think the key there is that um, even if they use um, slightly different language and it's not possible for the student to predict beforehand what language they're going to use, um, the fact that you have all the classes on there actually saves you because I can type machine learning and then it'll look at the machine learning course description and it'll see, well, yeah, it says machine learning, but it also says inference, it also says statistics, it also says Bayesian, it also says probability. And then um, 6437 doesn't say machine learning anywhere, but it says inference, inference is in the title, in fact. And it says Bayesian and it says probability. And then maybe um, the course two class only says inference. And so now um, we reach this point where the course two class doesn't have any words in common with the machine learning class, but they're still sort of about the same topic. And because of the force directed nature of the layout, because um, the links act as springs and pull class related classes together, they'll still end up in the same like region of the screen. Yeah. Um, so right now it looks like you you give it like you give it like text of like almost for this kind of class or kind. So what about for something where you have like a set of classes and you're like these are the ones that I enjoy find me something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can definitely build on top of this something that will just 
um, look through, like if you give it criteria saying, these are the evaluation metrics I care about and this is the classes I want to be similar to, you could have something that tries to maximize your utility in that case. But I think what I really like about this layout is the serendipity. Um, I think we as humans are much better anyway at um, recognizing patterns and things like that. And so having all, like we're able to process this kind of information. And an algorithm may miss something that you would see if you were looking at this, I think. Um, but that said, you can always start with a class you care about. So you click on 6437 and say, I enjoyed that. And then you look one, one it highlights all the neighbors for you. So you can like look one away and say, well, 6441 looks interesting. What is that connected to? And click on that. And um, so I think that that kind of exploration might be more effective, actually. I don't know why I'm actually filling out the course evaluation to like, on a scale of one to 10, tell me how green this class is. And you're like, I, I don't know, right? <laughs> um, so do you find that like, you know, users when they're, they're trying to play around with, you know, how much they care about particular metrics are also just sort of confused? I, I think people definitely are confused. And um, I think that that's a systematic problem we have here at MIT. People aren't used to thinking about this kind of thing because nobody has ever let you say that this is what I care about and then given you classes that fit those criteria. So I think that's um, a systematic change that will, should happen and will happen here. Um, I know that in the months that I've been playing around with this, I've it, it's made me think much more about what my priorities are. I'm started looking at my classes right now and being like, I really like this class, but like just seeing that isn't enough. Let me think about why I like it. And I've become much more sensitive to things like not having a textbook really frustrates me. Like it really frustrates me. I hate studying from slides. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. So how does how does that also you know is it, well, what's 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 essentially your metric for are they similar the two classes are very different but they're very well taught mm -hmm. how how linked are they as opposed to you know a course two and a course six class that are exactly the same material you know, what's 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 the metric for so the question is are links based on teaching style as well as content? And the answer is no. Um, the links are based purely on content. Um, and I don't want to mix two types of links because then you lose the spatial grouping property, which I really like. Um, but what you can do is if you have classes, I, I mean, because I, I think they're sort of orthogonal because you can say that these are the metrics I care about and then everything else will disappear off the screen. And so that's how classes that have similar evaluation metrics are linked. Well, linked. So I have a question about the sliders up there. Do the sliders represent how much I care about a particular factor on the evaluation form, or do they do they represent you know what grading that received on the on the? So um, that's a good question. What I, so actually I think this is an old screenshot. Um, what I replaced this with is a double slider. So you can say I want things in this range, and it'll only show things in that range. So you can say in terms of workload, for example. I want high workload, or I want low workload, or I want medium workload. So, the, so it represents, um, on, so let me pick an example. Um, average hours per week in lab, it represents hours from zero to 30, for example. And you can, when you have two sliders there, or like two buttons on the slider, you can slide them apart to say, I don't care at all. So cover the full range. Or you can slide them together and say, show me things that have exactly 15 hours a week in lab. Or you can do anything in the middle. Yeah, so it's an absolute filtering. Um, so if you wanted to weight um, different criteria, how you would do that is uh, in terms of the slackness. So for example, if you care sort of about lab time, but not too much, then you have a relatively wide range there. So you say, well, actually, I want 15 hours per week, but I'm flexible on that, so let me say 10 to 20. 
Yeah. Yeah, because it's not an optimization algorithm. Again, I'm not trying to take the power away from the students or from the advisors. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm Sarah. Uh, hi, I'm Adin. And we're here to present EduCase. The idea behind EduCase is that recording video is expensive. You have to buy costly equipment, hire a cameraman, and then waste hours editing. And for universities like MIT that want to record video lectures for their students or for initiatives like OpenCourseWare, edX, et cetera, it's neither cost effective nor scalable. Introducing. EduCase. EduCase consists of three devices, one per lecture hall board. Each device has a Kinect, we have one over here by the way, um, and a PC. We use the Kinect to detect and recognize various gestures, such as writing on the board or erasing, etc. The idea behind this is that there's only so many things that a professor can do in a lecture, and that's enough information to edit the video. But we go beyond that. This whole project wasn't really inspired by some intrinsic desire to help MIT save money. It was actually uh, arose from frustrations that we had as students watching open, open courseware videos. So I'm watching a 6046 lecture, and the professor writes this big equation on the board. And I'm trying to like figure out what this equation means. And then instead of focusing on that equation, the cameraman starts following him around the room. Um, so I have to pause the video, rewind back, and then you know, like figure out the equation and then keep playing the video. But it doesn't just end there, no. I, the professor like, writes down another equation using some other variable that he had defined previously on, guess what, a different board. So you have to go, rewind back, etc. So because we're recording every single uh, because we have three of these devices, we're recording the entire scene. That means that we're recording all of the content and so we can provide a more dynamic experience for students. Because instead of just you know, pausing the video and rewinding back, we can simply flip back to a previous board while the lecture continues to play in the background. And you know, it's always also really annoying when professors uh, write something really, really important. and then turn around and ask, so what does that really important thing that I wrote behind me say? Now, they don't actually ever say that, but that's always what's going through my mind. Um, so as for, as for that professor, that's taken care of with our invisibility cloak. And that's EduCase. Automated lecture recording, the easiest, quickest, and cheapest way to record and edit video lectures. Any questions? Do yes, we actually do some, well, define post processing. Does a person have to look through the video and do anything to it? Uh, the, so there's some, uh, in the very beginning, um, but some of the information that we use to edit the video includes like the location of a chalkboard. So what we'll have, a, uh, like, have uh, someone do is basically mark the like, location, we'll give them a frame and we'll say, okay, tell us where the chalkboard is. Do you mean by the like after the lecture, or you mean like before? No, after the lecture is recorded, we say here are a few, a few frames that we recorded, mark where the chalkboard is. Um, and then we also, like, because we have three devices, they're not all really cloud connected. We just take a, like, actually we only have one device now, but we pretend we have three. Um, we have some tricks to do that. Uh, but we, like, we just take a flash drive and put it onto a more powerful computer. Um, so, but after that, it just pressing a button. Um, once you say, okay, I want these files, like this is board one, this is board two, this is board three, and then that's the extent of the, the actual editing that goes in. I kind of cheated when I asked this question earlier. <laughs> um, but during the invisibility cloak, what is it showing behind the person? Is it just a still of the um, board itself, or what's happening there? 
Yeah. Yeah. So it's the still of the board after the person leaves, um, so that you can see effectively what they're going to write. Uh, we can do this because we have the whole video, so we can just go back in time and look what's going to be there and put it there instead of a person. It involves a TA or a student, like, um, or the professor who can just go in there and set it up real quick. So, like, I can set this up faster than it takes the professor to set up the PowerPoint presentation because I'm always late to class. So, I've I've had lots of user tests there. One more about user gestures, and then we spoke about a little bit out there. But how are you using the connected user gestures for editing and perhaps point processing? With Sorry, with the gestures. User gestures. Oh, the, the gestures. Yeah. Um, so right now uh, we have pointing. We also have like interaction with Blackboard is what we call it, which basically means you're really close to the Blackboard and you're doing something with it. Um, we also have waving, but that's not really useful, and dancing, but also not useful. <laughs> and uh, we found that that's actually like does a pretty good job of finding when to actually switch videos there's some like there's plenty of work to be done as far as iterating on that goes um, but it's a very good like first start and the gesture engine is very modular you just kind of define a new gesture and it's we're using state machines um, for the gesture recognition Have you gone through yes and there are no memory leaks <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have tried to, so we only have one device, that's the problem. Um, this device is fairly expensive to be coming out of my pocket, um, so now I'm trying to convince other people to, uh, if anyone's in the room wants, <laughs> wants to buy some more. How much is it? Uh, it's about a thousand dollars total. Um, so like about, this kind of makes up for, so if you record few lectures with a cameraman, um, this will pay for itself in that many. Also, it's monetizable because advertising space. So <laughs> we can get people to sponsor Connect for classroom and devices for classrooms. So it's, it's student expensive, it's not student expensive. Yes, it's right. student expensive, yeah. Um, <laughs> right now you're recording videos with the camera in the Connect? Yes. Okay, so how does that quality of that compare to say what you would get from a professional camera? Uh, right now, the quality is pretty terrible. Um, the 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 quality on the Connect is pretty low resolution. We have plans of uh, also calibrating it with a, a higher definition RGB camera, uh, which uh, would uh, which would be separate from the computer and kind of record on its own. And then uh, we synchronize everything using audio, so we can just add devices, and as long as they're recording audio, we can synchronize them. Um, the other thing is that there are rumors that Microsoft's going to release a 180p Connect, and I'm kind of waiting on that one. Um, so we'll see at E3. Is that the what? Yeah, but it makes sense business wise for them to do that. So. <laughs> Uh, we are, so we're still experimenting with the gesture recognizer. Right now we have state machines, so it's not really any training that goes into it. Um, we have, like, recorded some things and have pl been playing around with HMMs, but we haven't really figured out how to detect the start of a gesture. Um, and the other thing is, because of this interface, like, if it gets it wrong, the student can just flip back. And if we see enough students are flipping back, well, then we know that something's wrong with the video, and so we can edit that. We can just use data to fix that next time around. I like giving Microsoft money. Um, no, I just <laughs> it's it's the it's the infrared. Um, the the uh, it's having so first we can detect like the the like how far away you are from a blackboard. Um, it's much faster than doing like just recognition of where bodies are um, and 
trying to uh it, there's been some image processing to try and detect gestures but it's not very good uh stereo cameras could also be an option um but i don't know anything about that and it's harder to work with and it doesn't look as slick so And just in case that wasn't clear, the, the way that we can actually do the gestures is because the infrared camera is what's being used to define the skeleton, um, not the actual RGB image. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, you need something with, with a solid state drive and uh, enough, just enough power to deal with all of the processing that happens as you're as you're taking in the video. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be this. Uh, I guess if if you know if you can monetize it by putting you know some sort of advertisements there, then having a screen that you can actually see is useful as well. Um, so you said that like doing the proposed club works by like putting a future image on the screen. If uh, the professor like erases that board and then comes back to it, like a totally different. Oh, so it doesn't really do, okay, so what it, uh, he asked, um, it, it, there's some unclarity about how the invisibility cloak works. Um, so basically, there's this board behind me, okay, I'm standing in front of it. If I move, then there's, like, now I see that I'm no longer in that space with the board, so we can capture that image. Then, in order to be a little bit tricky, right, because it's not really useful to see, like, what's been previously written on the board if the professor is standing there writing things on the board. Uh, we reverse the video first and do the exact same process so that um, you end up with the future board. But it's basically like if you've moved for about, if you've been away from a certain area for about 20, 30 frames, it, it differs, it, um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but um, then it will, like it'll call that the background. Like 20 or 30 frames yes, yeah, it's, it's 30 frames a second, yeah. Next. What's next? Lots of stuff. Uh, so we are experimenting with uh, audio, uh, like how we can use audio to also uh, tell us what's going on in the lecture. Um, you can actually kind of like faintly hear the chalkboard sounds in in uh, like higher quality audio recordings. Um, we are also using that when we talk to edX, uh, one of the things that they mentioned was that they also cut out like silences in the video. Um, so that's another thing that we're basically trying to get it to like reasonable quality that someone would want to watch it, but those are things to, to be added. Um, making the gesture engine a little bit better, uh, as well as buying like a couple more devices and recording the full lecture rather than one third of a lecture um, would be very helpful. Uh, so that's what's kind of happening in the next two weeks. Next year? Um, well, I'm trying, <laughs> hopefully edX will, will use it. We've been, we've been talking to edX, they've been interested. We've been playing email tag every so often. Um, and it, like, they're interested in it for the scalability. Um, they recognize that 30 video editors in a room isn't really cut, gonna cut it for too long. Um, and like, so hopefully we can get it into their hands. Um, given that we can do some more development on this. But I mean, I'm gonna be working on this, on this over the summer. I don't really know about Adin yet, but um, I kinda have to finish it for my thesis, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that should hopefully happen. Um, and so, so there's plenty of room. Part of the thing is that we're, we're looking for, we're not 100% sure on what's gonna be you know, the best solution, right? Right now, there's really no other game in town because you can't record lectures that people can go and see that you know are blackboard lectures and that it just doesn't get done effectively unless you can pay someone to do it, which is only gonna work here for like two classes a semester, um, like, seven, like the big classes, right? So, so what we have now has, you know, uh, you know, has the, is start, you know, is working, we need, you know, some more devices and a little bit of, you know, like the audio editing, maybe add in like an HD camera or something like that to make it better. But then 
you know, going forward, if that's not necessarily, you know, there may be ways to then improve upon that, right? You have multiple, you have all of the, all the um, death data, so you could create point clouds, right? And now you have three, cam three, uh, three different point clouds from different angles of the entire room, and so you basically have a, you know, 3D area depicting the lecture room, and you can go wherever you want. That gives you the optimal view within the room. Uh, and there's actually been some work with the Kinect that does sort of all the point cloud work for you, which is kind of cool. Yeah, so uh, it seems like uh, right now you guys are mostly focused on creating the visuals, the data found. But then uh, it also feels like there's a lot of work that needs to be done afterwards. So like you talked about uh, having the students collecting the data, how students or how people view the videos, how they interact with it. So have you guys thought of any plans to, you know, are you, go, are you going to build your own, you know, UI front end so that user can interact with your videos and then you can collect data? Or, you, you know, what's the plan with that? Well, the UI front end um, would be, uh, so, event, so right now uh, it's not a web app, so we would make it a web app call into YouTube APIs. And it's not very difficult to be collecting data about when a student like clicks to a previous point in the lecture. And then, um, you know, if we see that people are doing that often, or maybe it's not even, the thing is we don't really know whether it's a useful, there's, there's a lot of potential, lots of work to be done, lots of areas to explore. Um, it's a big project. It, like, it's not close to done yet. Um, but it's, I still believe that in, it's an area worth exploring and continuing on with. I can't say with absolute certainty, like, what the best steps would be. Um, I can give you guesses, like, I think audio is a really important, um, next step to keep focusing on. I think the quality is, um, and I think that, that I'm not sure it's too important to be gathering data about when students are clicking. I, I, I would table that for a little bit, um, but I can't give you more of a concrete timeline. It's, it's definitely evolving over time. Is that? Thank you very much. Can we do a, a round of applause for everybody and the judges? Thank you.